Hello, and welcome to another game development broadcast for Project CSK. I'm the creator of Project CSK, and the online name that I go by is Des. I'll be continuing development like I have been doing for some time, and today is going to be no different in that I'll be continuing development from where I left it off. But it's starting to get more and more interesting, the development part of it, because in, in my opinion, of course, uh, we're getting into the more interesting parts of the development, the pets, the world, and all the other things that are going to start coming in over time. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, and I hope you are too. Uh, but uh, thank you for being here. And uh, I'll be continuing development like I have been doing for some time now. Now, Project CSK is a project that I have been working on for some time. Uh, roughly uh, 10 years ago is when I started this project, and I've been working on it off and on since then with some large breaks in between, of course, but the project initially started off with Adobe Flash Player. So the client side, specifically the client, was created in uh, Adobe Flash Player, or sorry, should I say it was made uh, with the plugin for Adobe Flash Player. Uh, but uh, it was created, of course, in ActionScript 3. Now, lots changed in that decade from then to now, which leads us to roughly the present time. But as of the start of this year, 2020, I know it's been a crazy year. Hi, Hell Candy. Thanks for joining. I hope you enjoy the show and I hope you're well rested. Uh, so at the start of 2020, I, I, I had to come up with the decision of, okay, so do I let the project fade into oblivion or do I restore the project and rebuild the client and improve on it and make it better and do all the things that I wanted to do and make it completely awesome? I thought about it. I didn't have to think about it very long, to be honest. The answer was, of course, yes. I would much rather uh, recreate the client and uh, improve on it and make it better and do all these ideas that I've had with the project for a really long time. And Unity was the perfect match of a platform. Yes, it's not perfect. Let's be honest, Unity is not perfect by any means, but that doesn't mean that it's not something that is not uh, appropriate to be used for this project. It's actually perfect for this project because you can create it in Unity and then it can be cross-platform and it can be used on a wide variety of platforms, all types of inputs, whether it's a mobile device, desktop, laptop, even consoles. Uh, you can export it from Unity if you have the licensing, of course, to export to consoles which is a really neat idea as well. So um, Unity was the perfect, uh, perfect match there for what I would like to do with the project. And not only that, uh, Unity is far different from Flash. It's not even fair to compare them because they're, they're not one and the same. So Flash, uh, Flash Action Script 3, the latest one, uh, was running on AVM2, Action Script Virtual Machine 2, something like that. Before, with Action Script 1 and Action Script 2, they had AVM1, which the performance was not good. It was never made for games. Flash was never made for games. That was never the intention. It just happened to go in that direction. AVM2 came out with ActionScript 3. It was superior in performance, superior in functionality, and a wide variety of other things, which was great, but it just was not meant for games. It has no GPU support. Yes, at near end of life, they came out with some GPU support that was not backwards compatible, did not work on most systems, incompatibility issues across the board, across the browser, and they just gave up on it. Um, but what happened was, though, where Flash reached its near end of life, it allowed for others to come and be the successor and move forward, just as Flash was a successor to those that came before it as well. Those had to exist for Flash to exist. Flash had to exist for other platforms to see the potential of the usability of Flash to pick it up and move forward with creating that type of a technology for those specific case scenarios. Unity happens to be one of those. Part of Unity's success is thanks to Adobe Flash. Of course, Adobe Flash was originally Macromedia Flash until Adobe bought it out, but that's a completely different story. 
So the interesting part of it, though, is that, and what really sets them apart was Flash runs purely on your CPU and it runs on an ActionScript virtual machine. So the performance loss right off the bat is a serious hit. And that's why it does not run well on mobile devices. It was never going to run well on mobile devices. No matter how much resources uh, Adobe was willing to put into it, it was never going to happen. If you're running on a virtual machine on a mobile device, which is already low powered, it's a lose-lose. There's no winning. You're better off having it compile and run natively, which is what Adobe did near the end, but it was too late. Everyone, for the most part, the industry had moved on. The demand of what Flash once was, the bleeding edge at the front end, the demand for that kind of functionality had already surpassed significantly of what Flash could provide. So. Unity and other platforms stepped in. Unity is cross-platform, can compile and build and run natively on the device, meaning you get to access GPU and GPU functionality. So you're not putting the entire load of every single resource and every single calculation, whether it's graphics, uh, audio, video, whatever it, the case may be, you're not putting the entire load onto the CPU. The CPU was not designed for that. The GPU is. That's why we have graphics cards. That's why there's dedicated graphics cards. That's why the graphics card industry is such a boom. Like try getting a latest RTX 3000 graphics card or Radeon graphics card. Those things, they sell out the second they come out for those obvious reasons, because those serve a very specific role, which the CPU was never designed for in the first place. But the great thing about Unity is that it gives us the ability to use GPU hardware functionality. That's where this superior performance comes into play. So now we have both the CPU and the GPU, and the GPU can do true 3D. You can have 3D models, you can have meshes, textures, you can use shader graph, you can do all kinds of fantastic things that you simply could not do with purely with the CPU alone in Flash. And I'm not putting Flash down. It served its purpose for its time. It was great. It was the leading edge. Everyone else was so far behind. But Flash, being the leader that it was, it couldn't see past its own success and was unable to foresee the future, but others did. And that's where Unity and others came in. So that brings us to pretty much the present with Project CSK. When this is going to be rebuilt and when you see uh, and you get to see, I guess, more of my vision, because I don't want to bring things up that I have uh, on my to-do list that are going to be down the line. I don't want to really talk about those because those are not fair to say, yeah, in, in a year from now, we're going to be able to do this awesome stuff. No, I don't want to bring that stuff up. Know that it exists. I've already mentioned some of this stuff inside of my 10th uh, anniversary video that I did or broadcast that I did, and then I uploaded it to YouTube. So I've already discussed a good number of those. I don't want to bring all of that stuff up, but let's just say those are on the to-do list and then some. And some of these you're going to see sooner than later, and they're going to be really interesting. Um. And gradually, as we make progress with the project, I'm giving you a behind the scenes look of what's going on with the project. So it is both a source of in my, and the purpose of it is for it to be a source of entertainment, as well as something you can potentially learn from or be inspired by for your own personal case of whatever it is that you want to do with it. Now, there's going to be some really interesting changes coming in the future, in the near future, should I say, that I can guarantee you you're going to like. You're definitely gonna like it. And the world part of it is uh, a huge part of it, of course. Uh, the world, you'll see me 
uh, in the not so distant future, you'll see how the world is going to transform. And uh, I don't want to give it away just yet, but let's just say it's not what you think it's going to be. It's going to transform different and be very different than what I've previously shown with the current uh, design, uh, the current latest one that I've shown you. That's not what it's going to look like. So keep that in mind in the future, not too far in the future. But what I've also been doing um, off, uh, off broadcast, so off camera, is I've been doing quite a bit of uh, behind the scenes stuff, like whether it's artwork, uh, other types of management, uh, uh, trying to secure resources for the project, which is really difficult, um, as well as uh, trying to uh, benchmark the project uh, or, or do performance tests on individual standalone prototypes to see what works and what doesn't work for the project. And I've come up with uh, some interesting uh, results. Uh, I know there's going to be some significant performance improvements that are going to need to be done. But um, from, from the conclusion that I've come to so far, uh, in the settings option, which has yet to fully exist, uh, there will be different levels of um, of visual uh, performance settings, like, sorry, uh, visual quality settings. Uh, so you'll be able to set low, usually for the low-end mobile devices. You'll be able to set medium. You'll be able to set high. You'll be able to set very high, and then maybe an ultra or maximum or whatever you want to call it for uh, desktops, and then some more uh, options in there as well. Uh, that's definitely direction I wanna go with it because uh, I've noticed specifically when I'm doing testing on my local system on, um, that sounds intriguing. Yeah, just wait till you see what I got in store. I promise you'll like it, Hell Candy. I promise. But so with the testing that I've done, I've noticed that I'm getting varying results. Uh, on the devices that I'm testing on, specifically on low-powered uh, devices, Android devices specifically, the uh, the iPhone and iOS stuff, I don't have that hardware to test with, but as far as I know, and based on the research that I've done, they generally have, it's not fair to say superior hardware, but they're more performance optimized because it's only one operating system with a very specific hardware and it is performance tuned specifically to that hardware to get the absolute best performance you can possibly get. Now, the disadvantage that Android has in comparison is that you get a wide variety of all kinds of different components inside of it. And there has never been, as far as I know, an Android operating system that has been performance tuned to a specific set of hardware. No manufacturers go to that extent. They just make sure that it works. It's, uh, it gets decent performance, like pretty decent performance. And then that's where they leave it, right? And in addition to that, uh, when um, when Apple comes out with updated iOS uh, um, operating system updates for these mobile devices, uh, oftentimes you get a bit of a performance improvement with that. And they support up to, I believe, six years back, which is impressive. It's pretty good for mobile devices. On Android, you'd be lucky to get two or three. Uh, that's realistically the best you can hope for. Some of them, not even one year. If you're going with the low-end devices, you won't even get past one year's worth of updates, and then they will drop support for that device. So you're never really utilizing the hardware that you have to its maximum capabilities. So that's why I say on iOS, you'll probably get some better performances because Unity is uh, has done exceptionally well for performance optimizations to run on uh, iOS devices because there's only a set number of hardware, uh, a limited number of hardware, and it's uh, fairly easy to, um, to performance optimize for that specific hardware. Whereas for Android, there's so many combinations, it's, it's unrealistic to expect that of anyone at this point.
So as a result of that, uh, the testing that I've been doing uh, on low-end devices, um, I've noticed that the uh, when I really push it, this is before me doing any performance optimization to the game or anything like that, on the low-end devices, it will dip down to about 30 frames per second. On um, anything that is, I would say, mid-range to, to high-end, pretty consistently 60 frames per second uh, based on the testing that I've done. On desktop, um, it's you don't even have to worry about it. Uh, on a desktop, you could run this game on a uh, old uh, computer or laptop from like 10 years ago and still get 60 frames per second easily. So. But anyway, that's just a little bit of background and uh, a little bit of things that I'm working on behind the scenes. And uh, as time progresses, you'll see more and more of how all of these things tie into each other, into the project. And uh, you'll get a better understanding of the vision and the direction that the project is going. Now, another thing that's really important to keep in mind is that Flash is reaching end of life and it's reaching end of life very soon. Um, it's actually about just over a week away. So um, once that browser update comes out in uh, about a week and a half, two weeks, uh, you can pretty much say goodbye to Flash uh, in the browser unless someone figures out some workaround, which I have yet to hear anything about. What I do know is you can still run it locally. So if you can run it locally, uh, So if you can run it locally then, um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to avoid breaking the uh, the Flash client version in its entirely uh, and hold off for a little while longer until I get to that point where uh, it's necessary to say goodbye to Flash. And the reason why I say that is because uh, some users who are interested in still playing, you can download a standalone Flash player and run the application itself and then load the Flash Swift file uh, into that application. And in theory, you should still be able to play the game because that's exactly what I'm doing here on this, um, on this client that I'm showing you. So on this character that I'm moving around, this is not in the browser. This is a standalone Flash Player application. Of course, this was provided by um, Adobe themselves. So this is a part of the Adobe Flex uh, SDK. This is specifically for development purposes. So uh, I mean, that just means that these things exist. So uh, that means there's potentially gonna be options and uh, we'll have to wait and see how that goes. Uh, assess the potential options at that time and move forward with the appropriate solution. But at a certain point, it will completely break. I mean, I will completely break it uh, when I do a server update on the live site and this Flash client will no longer work in any way, shape or form. It will not be able to communicate and synchronize with the server. But uh, so yeah, that's kind of a, a bit of an update about it. But um, enough about that. Let's get into the project itself and see where we last left things off. Now, if you've seen the previous videos, then you know pretty much where I left things off. So let's give it a run and uh, see where it's at. Of course, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I don't mind. Okay, so we'll log in. Go into the world. Okay, so this is pretty much how far we got it last time. So I can move around. I can bring up um, the pet panel or my pets, should I say, and I can flip back and forth. And right now, because I have no pets summoned, uh, they both show up as uh, gray to the left side of it. So there's a gray dot. I don't know how well you can see that, but I hope it's clear enough. But then I can select any one of them. So we'll select Cookie Monster. And then I click Summon. And there's Cookie Monster. 
So Cookie Monster is now seen on this client as well as this client. Oh, on the Flash version, it's hidden in behind, uh, in behind the Guardian, but it is there. It is there. Okay. So uh, now that it's summoned, this this doesn't update yet, so this doesn't show. But what I can do is I can collapse it and bring it back, and you'll see that Cookie Monster is summoned. Actually, I could have just done this as well, but you can see that Cookie Monster um, is summoned, uh, and this is as far as we got um, in the past broadcast. What we didn't do is have the pet follow you. So right now, when I'm moving around, the pet does not follow me. It just stays there stationary. And I think that's um, that's likely going to be the next thing that I want to do because this pet does not follow me. However, on this one, when I move it around, right, you'll see that the pet follows because the functionality, a uh, good chunk of it exists. I just need to uh, link the logic together so my own pet moves with uh and follows me and then sends that information to the server and then when that sends the packet information to the server then the server can synchronize the other clients that are connected to it specifically like the flash client and whatnot right so that's what i want to do so you can see that the functionality uh, a good chunk of it is there i just need to be able to uh utilize it and um that's what uh, I pretty much want to do next. And uh, this, uh, the pet section, if you've seen uh, the YouTube videos, I think we're on like episode 10 or something already. I, I forget exactly. But uh, yeah, it, implementing this kind of functionality, it takes quite a bit of time. Like that's 10 episodes of YouTube, roughly uh, two hours each, we'll say. So that's 20 hours of uh, me working on it uh, live. That's not the offline uh, time that I put into it and the logic that I tried to figure out in between broadcasts offline. So the, the whole pets thing, it's still got a ways to go, but you can see that we're making pretty good progress. So what I want to do next is I want my pet to move, right? It makes sense. Of course, we want the pet to move. We want it to follow along and uh, follow uh, us being the uh, the owner of the pet because it's the owner. So whoever's the owner is the one that the pet will follow. And then that client, whoever that client is, so in this case, it would be the Unity client, is responsible for sending the appropriate packets at the appropriate time to the server. And then the server will take that packet data, validate it, and then synchronize it uh, with all the clients that are potentially in the area. So that's, uh, that's what I want to do next. And uh, let's have a look at that and see how can we implement that. But before we do that, what I want to do is I want to have a quick look at the, um, the Flash version of it to see how I did that. In the back of my mind, um, I, I have a pretty good idea of how I want to implement it, but I want to refresh my memory because this is a long time ago. I haven't looked at a lot of this code uh, in a very long time. And it's like the client is roughly the current client. It's about, uh, I would say a million lines of code. So that's quite a bit of code. There, there's no way. I'm going to remember even 10% of that and have that be on the front of my mind at all times. That's not going to happen. So doing these refreshers is a good idea. So let's have a look at that and uh, see what that looks like. And then uh, we'll uh, borrow some conceptual stuff from it. However, I don't think I will implement it exactly in that manner. We'll implement it likely a little differently on the Unity version. Okay, so let me just bring this up here. Okay, it's almost loaded. So Hell Candy, how's your weekend? Was it restful? 
And uh, are you looking forward to the uh, Christmas break and New Year? That's my question to you. Okay, so what am I looking for? I want to specifically look at the my pet stuff and we're going to have to trace some of the logic forward and backward and see uh what we want to borrow from it and where we want to deviate away from it so let's uh let's track it down and see where that even is cuz uh i i don't remember i really don't so i need a bit of a refresher here okay so what i do think is let's see hmm there should be a my pet one or or something in here one of these has got to be related oh Controller pet battle UI. Uh, no, don't want the battle UI. Packet sequencer, no. Battle effects, no. There has to be a my pet um, controller class here. My pets manager. Okay, let's let's go with that and see what we can find. So for my pets manager. We should have a my active pet or or something. Current pet object data. Okay, that looks promising. Let's have a look at that. Okay, so current pet object data. Okay, so that's not really helpful. That's okay. So I need to close some of this stuff. Okay, controller creatures manager. I'll leave that open. My pets, I'll leave open. Um, my pets manager. Wait, this one is creatures manager. I have user pet. Hmm. This is a good song. Okay, let's see. How can we approach this? Let's approach it backwards. I'll look at the the information we send to the server that is my pet. Um, my pet, my pet send position. Perfect. That's what I want. So, uh, control shift F to, uh, bring it up. Okay. So what we send to the server is position X and Y. Okay. But where do we call this from? Okay, so let's trace it backwards. Send position. So we call it from here, which is user pet base. Okay. Internal event. Uh, position changed. Okay. So what calls internal event? Oh, it's an override function. Okay, uh, I need to go to the base class. World creature. I'll copy this first. So this extends from world creature. Let's see, is it here? Internal event, position changed. Okay, so here's my override function or the function that's set for override. But then what calls it? Okay, so walk to position. Okay, so we call a walk to position. If dispatch internal event equals true, okay. I don't know why that's there. I, I don't remember the logic behind that. 
You're well rested. Good. That's good. Okay, so we have this function that is Too bad we can't listen to the songs. I know it would probably get coffee written on YouTube. Yeah, I would get it. A, it's a DMCA strike. I would for sure get that. And uh, I want to avoid uh, that as much as possible. Um, but it is, uh, I mean, I understand why they're doing that. Because those who make the music, they are entitled to something. And those who own the rights to the music, they are entitled to something. People shouldn't just take their creative work and something that they were passionate about making and use it without ever compensating uh, those who created it. Because uh, when someone takes their time and effort to create something, they, in generally speaking, out of courtesy, they should be compensated to some degree uh, for the time and effort that they put into uh, making something that's awesome for other people. Okay, so this is kind of the, the meat of it here from what I can see. So this function, what this does, uh, and I think there's a bit more to it. So let's see, can I, do I even remember the bookmark shortcut? I think it's control F2. Nice, is that a bookmark or did I use the page break? I don't even remember. So if I hit F2, yeah, okay, so it is control F2. Okay, wow, I still remember the bookmark shortcut. Cool. Okay, so I wanna keep that one. Uh, so what calls a walk to position? Walk to position is called from server position update. Okay, so that's one location. Owner player position change. Okay, so that that's the main thing right there. Okay, so owner, player position change would likely mean when a player moves. This looks like another override function. So I will need to track this one and see where this one is being used from. Actually, I'll put a bookmark on this one too. Okay, so let's see, where's this one being called from? Okay, so it's not there. It's a override function, but it has to be called from somewhere. Oh, okay, so here we go. So here's where it calls the override function. And that's one of those things about um, using overrides functions to override a uh, function that was inherited from a base class. It gets a little tricky. And I didn't do the best implementation of this, but this was a, a good educational experience for me because of all the mistakes that I made in this Flash version of it, of doing it this way, I learned a lot from it. So it's because of that, that I have the knowledge that I have now. So uh, this was a good, really good educational experience for me to make this project. Okay, so it looks like uh, from here, handle character position update. That would be an event. So that would basically mean that when your player moves, and let's trace it backwards, all the way back. I know we're going in deep, many, many layers, but I want to look at what dispatches the event, and that should be this right here. Player position change. Okay, okay, so here's where we're moving. Okay, so this is when your player moves, okay? It calls this function. This function dispatches the event and says, okay, I moved on my X and Y position and it dispatches that event. Okay, so we don't need that one anymore, okay? And then it gets captured over here by the creature uh, or the pet, whatever you wanna call it. And then it, it checks to make sure that, um, well, it should actually at some point, 
But anyway, so it just calls handle character position change. So it's listening for that. And then it goes and says uh, owner player position changed. And that's where it calls the uh, override function. So we have position x, y. OK, so we can close that one as well. Where's my bookmark? Right here. And then that leads us to walk to position. I think I, I skipped over one. So at some point, it gets to here. And what it does is that it checks uh, and it does a little bit of trigonometry to get the hypotenuse, meaning the distance within uh, a circular radius of sorts. And it checks to see if distance is less than minimum distance. What is minimum distance exactly? So 40 pixels, roughly, we'll say. So if position of the owner is moved is under 40 pixels, then uh, it'll ignore it. But if it's greater than 40 pixels different, so as soon as you move more than 40 pixels away from your pet, that's when it will uh, try and follow you. So if you just move around in circles in a really small area, your pet's not going to do anything. And it's probably just going to look at you and give you a weird look like, hey, what are you doing? Like, make up your mind. But, um, OK, so we get that. And we check the distance. And then we get the angle from the distance. From the angle, we get face direction. There's a better way of doing that. OK, and then it does. Um, oh, and then it converts it to percentage value. OK, so distance per time gap would then be how much uh, does the pet move per x amount of time? OK, and then it does the move to. So it does the move to. So it moves to that position. And then it says event creature walking. It dispatches the event. Wait, where's the where's the part where we send it to the server? Did I miss that? Because this is all the moving stuff. Um, user pet base. Okay. Internal event position changed. Oh, OK. So that would mean that this would have to call internal event position change right there. OK. Oh, so that's what that's for, dispatch internal event. OK. It's not the best implementation, to be honest, but it does work. So what I'm taking away from this is that when you move your character past x amount, which is uh, 40 pixels, units of measurement in in uh, in Unity are different. So it doesn't use pixels; it uses uh, a different unit of measurement entirely. So I'll have to do a conversion, but that's okay. Uh, so what we need then is to check to see uh, the difference of movement, how much has uh, the player moved away from the current position of the pet. So the pet needs to know its master or owner. And um, we need to do a little bit of math there. And then um, what it will do is the position that the pet will move to is what gets sent to the server over here, so we send the position, position X, position Y to the server, and the server will uh, do its processing and synchronize all the other clients that are connected with the exception of your client, meaning because you're the one sending it, you don't need to be the one receiving it. That's why it goes past that. So once it does that internal event, that'll send it to the server. 
uh, based on the override function. And then this logic here basically uh, then takes those values, the differences, um, and does its logic to uh, just move the pet to the desired position. Okay. So first thing uh, then that we need to do is we need to capture your player movement. So the pet needs to know where is, um, how can we implement this now that I think about it? Because we need to put this logic in the appropriate location one, your the player, meaning the current client, will need to dispatch the information, which that's that's fairly trivial to do, but we will need to find an appropriate location for that as well. And then the other being that um, when it is a pet, and specifically a pet, it needs to know if it is to follow a target and then put all that logic in the appropriate location. So in theory, it actually doesn't matter who the target is. It just needs a target. That target could be anything. It could be a player, it could be a pet, it could be whatever. We shouldn't uh, focus on making it uh, strict in that sense. So it just needs to follow a target. So that means any target can dispatch its information, its position information, and then the creature, the pet, will follow it. Okay. So where can we put that kind of logic? Uh, let's start off with the creature. So we have my pets manager. We have dictionary my pets, okay? We have, I believe we should have a active pet or something. My active pet ID, okay. My active pet ID. Okay, and then what is my pet? Oh, it's this thing. Okay, so this is just a data container. I'm not going to put any logic of that sort in here. This thing will just purely hold data and be able to take uh, a network uh, TCP IP uh, socket information and parse through that data or the uh, payload of the uh, packet, should I say, and break it up into its individual components and then just keep storing it. And this will just continue to get bigger, bigger, and bigger over time of the different things that it stores. So I'm not gonna use that. Uh, I'm gonna leave that exactly as is actually. So what? where can we put this logic? Okay, so this is not the right location to do it. However. I should be exposing the current pet object. Should I not? Okay, now we'll get to that. We will get to it. So we need to figure out the appropriate location to, to put all of this logic. So we have the character model, which is, uh, let's go over to our prefab there and have a look at that and see uh, if it's appropriate to put it into the character model prefab, because I think you should, because uh, it is the character model that's doing all of this. And why shouldn't a character model be able to follow another character model, right? Because then if I put the logic in there and it's generic logic, then any model can follow any other model. It doesn't matter if it's a, a player avatar, a pet, an NPC, a, a whatever. Okay, so here's our character model. And here's all the classes that we have for it. 
what I'm thinking is I will put in another one here um, for follow. Hmm. Because we have one here, model position and sync. Let's have a look at that. So model position and sync uses position update and pet position update. Okay, but that's information coming from the server. That's pretty specific. And I don't want to put it in here. However, uh, since because all of these other component classes are here, each one of them give it very specific functionality. Like for example, input movement control, input action control. Input movement control would be um, joystick, touchscreen, keyboard, and mouse uh, of that kind of input. Input action control would be uh, Actions that are performed, I know it, it should probably be called something better, but that's for the actions to perform an action when a button is pressed. Uh, that'll send information to the server. Uh, model colliders, that's specifically for all collisions and everything related to the model. Uh, effect controller would be, of course, the visual effects, like let's say uh, when you get frozen, or when you use a shield or uh, things of that sort in the future, it'll be added on. Um, model KO would of course be specific to the model. When you're playing within a game room, the character model gets KO'd and gets thrown off of the stage, right? So that's the functionality for that. Animation property curve, that one, uh, I don't remember exactly what that is for, but I do know that it's used for something. KO, okay. So that's what does the arc of the KO when you get KO'd. And then we have model posi position, sync, uh, and animation, which is the one we were just looking at. Model appearance, meaning uh, the ability to change the model, uh, whether it's a pet, uh, player avatar, or whatever the case may be. So all of these are related to the character model. So what I'll do is, and they don't all have to be used. They can be sitting there dormant and used only when needed, right? So I'm okay with putting in that functionality into another component class and we'll just add it onto the list here. And I think that would be an appropriate uh, usage of it. I think so. So what I'll do is, that's what I'll do. Um, I will put in another one. Uh, let's see, what is... Okay, so we'll go into scripts. We'll need to create a new script here. Where can we put the script? We can just put in character model actually, since all the other ones are there as well. So I'll right click, create script, and we'll go with C sharp script. Uh, this one will be called model. Um, what can I call it? Because this one is going to be very specific to your pet initially. And then at a later time, I may revise it. But no, actually, this will never get revised because this is going to be a very specific to your pet and your pet only. Okay, so it won't get reused. It'll serve only this one purpose. So it then, um, I guess that simplifies the name of it. So uh, model uh, my pet follow. I think that's clear enough. I think it's descriptive uh, in that uh, looking at the class name, it gives you an idea of what it is. So 
Okay, so what I'll do, of course, is I'll namespace it first. Okay, so it's namespaced. I will take that and drop it onto the character. So we'll say add component. I'll just paste it in there. Okay, so we have that. What this will need is this will need a target. So a target object to follow. Do we want to use a target in that way? I don't know. We'll figure it out. I'll just put down some notes for now and then we'll, we'll figure it out afterwards. So it needs a target to follow, and it'll need the ability to uh, move. It will uh, need to uh, sync, uh, or sorry, not sync, but uh, send uh, packet data to the server. And yeah, that's that's actually all it needs, really. I mean, of course, we need to um, look at each one of these in more depth and uh, figure it out. But um, okay, so how can it follow a target? Now I can use the event system my internal event system or the Unity event system and have it so when your player moves, this will send a packet, or sorry, when the player moves, it'll dispatch an event through the event system and say, I've moved. And it'll do that X amount of times per second. So whether I have it dispatch an event or I just have this follow that one <clears throat> it would actually be more efficient to not go through the event system and just have it follow the target because otherwise um just give me a sec so we'll say private um game object and we'll say um follow uh target so what I'll do is I'll just have it follow another game object directly because it's almost the same thing as having the game object uh, move and then dispatch an event. So creating an event object, go through the event system, dispatch an event, listen to the event, capture the event to get to the same point, or I can just use the update so what I'll be using is I will actually use the update frame and follow that target. So this way, it would be more efficient because we wouldn't have to go through the event system, create and destroy objects, listen for the event, capture the event, and all that other stuff. So yeah, this would actually be uh, okay. So then we would need to check if... Uh, underscore follow target equals null, we will return, meaning um, there is no target to follow. And that'll be the case for most of the time. So that means this update won't do anything. It'll keep exiting out of it. So then here, past that point, is we will need to say, um, 
because I don't want to do it directly in the update. I want to kind of break up the logic into its individual core components. So what we can say then is uh, we'll call a function called um, something. Uh, let me just have a quick look at that again. Okay, so we want to check distance. Oh, okay. So we need to do the distance logic. Um, update um, target follow. Do I even need to do that? I don't think I really need to do that. But anyway, we'll we'll have a look at it. Okay, so what do I need? I need a distance minimum. Distance minimum is 40. Okay, and then I need to use the distance minimum from our current position to our target position. Okay. What I will do is I will grab all of this, copy it. and just paste it in here, just for reference. So then I don't have to flip back and forth. Okay. So we need distance minimum, uh, distance minimum. Uh, what I'll do is I will, so I wanna make it a serialized field. We'll make it a constant for now. So private constant int uh, distance minimum equals um, 40 um, no, actually, it'll be a uh, float because this is uh, Unity's uh, version, so it'll be 0 0.4f. Because uh, the way that I have it set up right now is pixels uh, converted to uh, to units, uh, it'll be a, a multiplier. So it'll be divided by 100. And 40 divided by 100, of course, is 0.4. Okay, so we have our distance. What we need is to get the hypotenuse. Um, I could do that. I generally try to stay away from trigonometry calculations inside of an update loop because they're uh, kind of performance demanding. Trigonometry calculations are not performant. Okay, so what I can do then is I can just build a simple um, simple comparison check. So what I can say is uh, private Boolean, and I can say um, a distance greater than. And it will take a float 
and say, um, no, it'll take position. So it'll take a vector three, because everything is vectors in uh, dealing with unity. So uh, vector three and vector two. So we'll say uh, vector three, A, and then vector three, B. So that would be our A and B comparison. And then the distance would be float. Um, minimum distance. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract and say vector three um, final equals uh, a minus b. And then we'll say if a dot x uh, greater than uh, minimum distance return true, and also if um, a dot y greater than minimum distance Or do I need to use math.abs? Because it could potentially be a negative value. And if it's a negative value, it'll fail. If you're not familiar with math abs, it's an absolute value. So it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative. Uh, so you could have uh, the value, for example, 100 um, would stay positive value but the value of negative 100 would be converted to a positive 100. So it's an absolute value. Okay, I'll need to put in a bit of debug here. Okay, but that's kind of the idea, is in, instead of doing a trigonometry call inside of a update loop that can run 60 frames per second, I would rather not and have this, which is similar. It's not exact, but it's pretty close. So instead of a circular boundary, it would be a square boundary, if that makes sense. So if you walk outside of a square boundary, your pet will follow you. Whereas the current Flash version, um, it's a circular boundary. So if you walk outside of that circle, your pet follows you. I hope that makes sense. I'm just trying to avoid the trigonometry uh, being called inside of an update function. Okay, so when we go to use that function, we will say if, so our position being um, game object dot transform dot local uh, position. Wait, no, that's not correct. We need to call the actual function. So we need to say uh, distance greater than, I know, not the greatest name for a function. If it equals false, I want to return again. I don't want to continue, but if it is not or sorry, if it is greater than, then I want to continue. Otherwise, I want to exit. So the first position we're going to send is our position. The second position we're going to send is the follow target, follow target dot transform dot uh, local position, and the distance minimum distance we will set it at distance minimum, which is the point zero or sorry point four f. Yeah, I, I, it, it's kind of not correct, but I need to just slowly build it out and uh, it'll make sense over time. Uh, I'll, I'll definitely improve on this logic, but uh, it'll make sense uh, once we get to that point. So 
what I want to do is I want to, of course, be able to set target. So the follow target, we will make a, um, we'll expose it. So control R E. I don't want you to do any of that. I just want that. Okay. And the reason why I do this is because I, I don't like to expose uh, private variables. I like to always expose it through a function that gives more control over it because then I can do other logic in between that and hook logic in between it. And it's just easier to debug instead of just making the variables public. Uh, the only variables that I make public for the most part are uh, constants. Those are the only variables that need to be public. Or if your class is purely a data container and it contains nothing but variables, then you can. But even then, I like to go through a function to expose private members of a class. It's just more strict and uh, it's better that way in my opinion. Okay. So now that we have a conceptual follow target, the update, it will check and see if it has a follow target. If it does not, it'll do nothing. Uh, otherwise, if it does have a follow target, it'll use our position comparison to the follow target position, and it'll check if the position difference is distance is greater than the minimum distance provided, it'll continue past to this point. Otherwise, it'll escape through the return. I want to test that out before I move any further. So how can we test that? We can... Um, how can we test that? We can use our test scene because I don't want to keep logging in to, to access that part at this point. It's really redundant. So we'll go to the scene. Where's my scene? There it is. Okay. So we'll go to um, world, which has kind of become our test scene. Okay, so inside of here, I believe I do have some, nope, not that, world map grid. No, where's my test stuff? I had a whole bunch of test stuff, or at least I think I remember having test stuff. On-screen buttons, okay, not that. Stage character model, okay, so there's, there's one model. Okay, so there's our test model. Let's see, if I run it, I should be able to walk around. Okay, good. So we'll have that one as uh, the one that we control. And then what I'll do is I will just hit Control D, duplicate it, and uh, I'll call this one and I'll move it over just slightly. And we'll just change the name of this one just so it's clear. So character model, pet. Okay. And we'll go and change the name. To pet. I know very creative. I called it pet. Okay, so right now if I move. So if I run this and I move around. Oh, the camera died. So right now, if I move, they'll move in unison. 
because they're both set to active input. So that's that's good. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the pet one, and I'm going to say input uh, user controlled no. Input action controls user controlled no. And then I th is there another one? I don't remember. Okay, so if I run it now, we'll just only move one of them. Okay, so then the pet stays still, and that's good. Okay, so now we're going to set the reference for the follow target. So we're going to tell the pet model to follow the other one. So that's where this logic will now get used. <clears throat> and what I want to do is I want to output the distance. I want to do a uh, sorry a debug, and we're going to get a lot of outputs off the beginning, but I'll I'll prune it down uh, over time. So debug dot log, and I want to see uh, value of a. Uh, sorry, value of x. So that would be um, fine. Oh, I did it wrong. Uh, final dot x. And then we'll say plus uh, x and then y. And we'll say final dot y. So these ones that I called a by accident, they're actually supposed to be final. Because we did uh, a minus b. So we want to use the final value. OK, so now we, we're going to get a lot of outputs. But I just want to see the difference. So when we run it, OK, so that's negative. So that's OK. And I'm looking at, at these outputs down here. So it's in the hundreds going into thousands very soon. OK, so that means I do need to use math.abs, which is OK. OK, so we have final A. Um, which is a minus b, okay? And then what I want to output is, sorry, I, I want to break that up a bit more. So I want to say um, float final, um, no, I want to call it something more meaningful. I want to call it difference x equals, um, math f dot abs and i want to pass into that uh, a final dot x and i'm going to control d to duplicate the line and i'll do the same for the y value so what i'm doing is uh making it so it's no longer negative values so they will always be positive values so I'll just modify my, my output here because I want purely positive values to work with. So final x will be difference x. Final y will be uh, difference y. Okay, so that should return us positive values only. So let's have a look at that and see. Okay, so x is 0 0.39. So if I move to the right, x is uh, 0.56, 7, and so on. And then if I move to the left, so now it's uh, the difference of x is 0 0.02. Moving to the left, 0 0.18, 0 0.3, 0 0.5. Yeah, so it, it stays positive. Same with y, whether I go up or I go down. It's it's always a positive value is what it's it's doing. Okay, so then what it should be doing is check if difference dot x is actually greater than or equal to, not just greater than, but we'll say greater than or equal to. I want you to return true. If it's not, it'll return false. Okay, so I don't need that output anymore there. What I want here 
is I want to follow the rest of the logic now. So if distance is greater than that, so what I'll do is, uh, this is temporary, of course, uh, vector three equals, um, hmm. Oh, potato cam again. Okay, thanks, Hell Candy. Yeah, I'll need to find a solution for that at some point. I just, uh, I just can't be bothered with it. Really, there's just so many other things. Um, it's, it was never meant to be used uh, like this for development purposes. If you just use a uh, camera like this uh, with applications and whatnot. Uh, but not developing, but using Unity specifically, when I go to build, what it does is it scans connected compatible devices to see if it should be building out to those devices and running onto those devices, which is what's causing the connection to break and the application that I'm using to uh, allow me to use my phone camera and output it so I, then I can use it as an input into OBS, it doesn't know how to handle that. So the two are not working well together, therefore it gets disconnected. It's unfortunate, but it does do that. Okay, so what I wanna do then is, um, wow, it's, it's already getting about that time where I need to call it for tonight. I wanna uh, get it to, uh, uh, just a little bit farther past this point, just so when I come back to it later, I'll have a better understanding of uh, where I left it off. Okay, so what I can say is vector three Okay, I think I know what I can do for now. So I can do this again. Now this is temporary, of course. So instead of um, the final A, B, what I'm gonna call it is uh, position difference. A will be, of course, uh, our position. And then B will be the target position. So we have position difference. And then what we can say is vector three, position new equals our position plus um, position that doesn't make sense. How else can I do this? I can use a coroutine. Let's use a coroutine. So we'll say uh, private coroutine uh, underscore uh, coroutine move to equals null by default. And then we'll say um,
No. I can't think properly right now. It's nearing that time. I had a bit of a rough day at work as well. Um, I can't think cr clearly right now. I'm not... I don't want to do anything I will regret. I don't think I want to do that either. I need to think about it. But the idea being that, so what we would do is, what we want to do is get the position extents of the um, follow target and then move to that position. And uh, movement uh, should be um, consistent and uh, gradual over time. That's kind of what I want to do. But I just can't think of a proper way. I mean, I could hack something together, but I would rather uh, not implement a uh, a poor implementation right now, because uh, this logic, um, it, it's going to be rewritten. This whole section is going to be rewritten anyway. So I'd rather uh, just wait until I'm, I'm fresh and I have time to uh, implement some proper logic. But the good thing is that we did kind of figure things out so that I do think this is the correct path of implementation to have a follow target, because then if you don't have a follow target, you're not going to follow them. But if you do have a follow target, then you would follow them. So right now, of course, the pet is not moving, but that logic is executing. And this is where I'll pick it up from on the uh, next broadcast. Or if I get a chance, of course, uh, I'll work on it uh, offline. But I think that this is, um, I think this will work. I just need to work out the logic. But to do that, I need to uh, have some time. And I need to be uh, in a bit better state of mind so I can think more clearly. And uh, I'll be able to implement a proper solution. I'm quite confident in that. Okay, uh, I think that's going to be it for today, though. Um, I know we didn't quite make as much progress as I would have liked to, but that's the thing, though. Progress isn't always about how much logic you can, how much code you can type out. It's about the logic that you can uh, figure out, which helps you out uh, for the next time when you sit down and you have some time to work through some logic. Then you can actually... Um, Take what you've done previously, look at your notes and whatnot, and implement an appropriate solution that could then be uh, something of value to the project. So uh, even though we didn't quite get that far, I do think that this is still pretty good progress and I'm happy with it. And I'll be looking forward to the next time when I come back to it. And uh, we'll be able to uh, likely within the next one or two broadcasts on this one, uh, I'll be able to get the pet to follow the character around and send its packet data to the server, which will be uh, pretty nice. So then we'll have another piece of the functionality implemented for the pets following. Because right now, I already showed you that when the Flash client moves around, it sends that packet data, uh, the appropriate packet data to the server, and then the server sends it to the Unity client, and the Unity client handles that data appropriately and has the pet following the, um, the target player around. It's just the other way around right now, where we are the one, the Unity client needs to be the one to send that information to the uh, server. It doesn't have that logic, and that's the logic that... Um, we need to implement on this side of it. So uh, we'll get there. We'll definitely get there. And uh, we'll, 
we'll add some more interesting things to it as well down the line that uh, you'll just have to wait and see uh, what that stuff is. But uh, it's going to be interesting nonetheless, that's for sure. But that's going to be it for me today. Um, I'm going to call it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the show. I know it wasn't the most interesting one. I, I mostly did talking and figuring stuff out, but still, I think that's of value because part of what I'm doing here is to uh, share with you kind of the, the thought and logic uh, and mind frame that goes on when implementing something like this, when programming, when trying to figure stuff out. What do you put where? What don't you put where is just as important as what you put where kind of logic, right? Because if you cram all your logic together without properly structuring them, it gets, uh, it gets messy really quickly and it gets to the point where it becomes unmanageable very quickly. But if you manage that logic and you manage it appropriately and categorize everything and structure it to its relative uh, uh, equal components, I guess, uh, for lack of a better term, that way it allows it to have um, a lot more potential growth. It can get much, much larger uh, before you need to rethink the structure of how you're structuring your logic, which then you can call a framework, right? So what we're doing is setting the foundation for the future potential logic and how everything is going to communicate. So it's okay to take a bit of time and think things through before, uh, you know, before sitting down and uh, implementing the coding part of it. Because that's an important part of figuring things out is, uh, isn't to just sit there and code, but to, before you code, think about what you're going to do. It's really important. Um, but uh, that's going to be it for today. So I hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, I will, of course, upload this one uh, onto YouTube when I get a chance later on. And uh, stay tuned for uh, more of these uh, broadcasts and videos. So, uh, yeah, uh, we're starting to get to the interesting stuff. And I hope you enjoyed it. And, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, of course, reach out to me and uh, let me know. And I'll do my best to answer them. But this is it. Uh, so have a great evening and uh, I'll see you next time. Bye.